This morning we will continue our study of the Gospel of John, and we will look at chapter 18, verses 1 through 27. I'm not going to read it in its entirety. Uh, at the beginning here, we will walk through it together. If you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to turn to John chapter 18. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the Corinthian church and he began to teach them about the Lord's Supper, he introduced the Lord's Supper with a particular phrase. He said, in the night, not in the night that Jesus created the new covenant. Not in the night that Jesus celebrated the Passover. No, when he wrote to the Corinthians to describe this night when, when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper with his disciples, he said, in the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed. That is what stuck out in Paul's mind about that evening. It was the night when Jesus Christ was betrayed. I don't know about you, but when I hear the word, when I think of the word betrayal, it is not an objective word. It's a subjective word. The truth is, everyone in this room has been betrayed by somebody. There are extreme examples of this in this room. There are less extreme examples of this in this room. But everyone sitting here could quickly come up with somebody who said they would do this, who said they would be this, who we have right expectations that they are committed to us and loyal, and yet those people who were supposed to be loyal were not. It's also true that everyone in this room has betrayed somebody else. Not one of us has been fully devoted to our word that we have said promises to others. We're just not that kind of people. Every marriage in this room, there is some level of betrayal. Think about the vows that you took on your wedding day. Till death do us part, I promise to do this. Whatever this is, none of us have done it perfectly. No husband has loved his wife the way we said we would on that day. No wife has respected her husband the way we said we would. Us as parents, we've not given our attention to our children to the degree that we have said we would, and, and so on. The list goes on and on and on. Betrayal is one of those things that it is so impacting in our hearts and our experience that it can cause great internal suffering and temptation to further sin because there are very few things that grieve us as much as betrayal. In this passage in, in John 18, this is what Paul is referring to. This is the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed. And, and the question a first-time reader would want to ask is, who betrayed him? You know, there's, a, there's an easier question to answer. Who didn't? We're going to see several different groups in this text. We think, of course, of Judas, and rightfully so, we will see in the text he is specifically called out as the one who betrayed our Lord. 
But the Jewish people, in particular the Pharisees and the priests, they betray Jesus. And then Peter betrayed Jesus as well. So with that cheery introduction, let's get into the text. It'll get better at the end. John 18, verse 1 says this, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron, where there was a garden in which he entered with his disciples. Now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples." So Jesus has finished what we call the upper room discourse or the farewell discourse where he's, he's given his final instruction to the disciples and now he heads to a familiar location. It's called a garden. John doesn't tell us this, but the other gospels tell us. It's called the, the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, that word Gethsemane is from the Hebrew that means oil press. So this was a place uh, on, near the Mount of Olives or part of the Mount of Olives where Jesus went to frequently there east of Jerusalem. And there was a great number of olive trees. And olive oil was one of the exports of, of Israel. The, the Jews were, were pretty proficient at uh, creating olive oil and they got a lot of their olives from this olive grove, the, uh, the, the, the Mount of Olives. And somebody, some wealthy man, had apparently owned a portion of it, and he had created a garden. Now, if you're like me, I grew up, my dad always had a garden in the backyard. When I hear garden, I think of vegetable garden. But you got to think of something much bigger than that. Think of uh, big, sprawling, gnarly olive trees, if you've ever seen olive trees, and then well-manicured paths and, and flowers and bushes and things, uh, trails. It was the kind of thing that had walls around it. It, was a, it, it took some work to create this garden. And so this, this wealthy man had this, this area set off and apparently he knew Jesus and welcomed Jesus frequently to enter into this olive garden area. And I shouldn't have said olive garden, now you're thinking lunch. Uh, not olive garden, olive grove <laughs> where all these trees are. And Jesus would go with his disciples on a, on a regular basis to pray and to, to get away from the city. It was, it was across this ravine from Jerusalem, from the, from the Temple Mount. The, uh, the ravine there, the Kidron, is a wadi. It's the kind of thing that during the rainy seasons, twice a year, was a torrent. It was, it was rushing water, but most of the year, it was bone dry. So this time of year, it would not have been too hard to, uh, to get across to the, uh, the garden. And he, he went there with his disciples, and John tells us that Judas was there and noticed the descriptive phrase, Judas, who was betraying him. This was one of the 12. This is one of those men that Jesus called at the beginning of his ministry, and he said, come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. This is one of those who saw Jesus do all his miracles, who heard him teach the word of God, who was hand-selected by Jesus, and now he is betraying him. He knew the place, because it was a frequent gathering of Jesus and his disciples. Verse 3, Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. Don't read past this too quickly without capturing what's being communicated here. Jesus is with 11 men. Jesus plus 11 equals how many? Thank you, 12. 12 men. Judas went to the Jewish officials and said, you guys want Jesus? 
I can lead you to him. I, I know where he's going to be. And then the Jews went to the Romans and said, hey, there's this insurrectionist about who's causing all kinds of trouble. And the Passover would be the perfect place for him to create a great disturbance. And the, the Romans hated disturbances. And so they sent some, some soldiers to go arrest Jesus. Now, here's how I imagine the conversation going. Okay, Judas, how big an army does Jesus have? Well, he didn't really have an army. Well, how many soldiers does he have? How many trained fighters? Um, zero? I mean, he's got a couple of fishermen. Does that count? No. <laughs> he's got a tax collector. Yeah, definitely not a fighter. Uh, you know, he's got 11 pretty simple dudes. All right, Judas, we'll take, take three or four soldiers with you and go get him. No, 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 no. No, 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 we need more than that. If you have the right footnotes in your Bible, it tells you this cohort, this battalion, 600 soldiers. And that's just the Roman soldiers. The battalion was actually a 1,000 but probably, they, they rarely sent a full thousand somewhere. But it was probably in the hundreds, possibly 600 soldiers, plus the temple soldiers. Now imagine this. Imagine you're hanging out in a botanical garden or something, and six or seven hundred armed soldiers show up. Why would they do that? I, again, I'm trying to imagine what Judas had to say to sell this. Now, you don't understand. This guy can do things. I've seen him do things. He can walk across the top of water. We had him surrounded one other time, or people had him surrounded one other time, and he walked right through the midst of them. At one point, the people were going to pick him up and throw him off a cliff, and he just, boom, got through them. So hundreds of soldiers show up, and surround Jesus and these 11 men. That's a lot of men, a lot of soldiers. I don't think you understand how significant this is. And they ask him, who do you seek? Verse seven is fascinating to me. Verses seven Verse 7, therefore, again, he asked them, who do you, so, well, let me, I'm sorry, let, let me back up to verse 5 and 6. They answered him, Jesus and Nazarene, he said to them, I am he, and Judas was with them. Verse 6, so when he said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. Now, again, I, I, I have two conflicting images in my mind as I read this. One is, they're, they don't know who he is. Most of these people don't know what he looks like. And when they show up and say, we're looking for Jesus, and he says, well, that's me, they all kind of, you know, they've heard the stories, and, and they all withdraw, and they trip over themselves, and just all fall down. But these are trained soldiers. And we have enough trained soldiers in this group. I don't want to insult you. If you were to show up after all your training and the guy you're looking for is right there, you're hopefully, please tell me, men, you're, you're not going to fall back and fall down when you actually find the person you're looking for, right? If that's the state of our army, we're in trouble, right? I don't think that's what's happening. Jesus said the words that he has said so many times throughout the gospel thus far. They ask him, or he asked them, who are you looking for? They say, Jesus of Nazareth, and he says... I am. Now, most of your translations add the word he, but the he is not in the original. He says, I am. This is the Jewish name for God. This is Yahweh. This is the name that God told Moses, go tell the people that I am has sent you. And when Jesus utters the word, I am, 
600 fighting men, trained soldiers, fell back and fell down. The only thing that makes sense to me was here was kind of like the Mount of Transfiguration, only without the visual without the, the shiny glory of his, of his being. But when he utters those words, I am, everybody fell down. Maybe, maybe a preview. that We are told that on that day, the last day, every knee will bow before Jesus. These are strong Weapon-holding soldiers trained for fights. And all he has to say is, I am, and they fall down. And then they get back up, <laughs> probably looking around like, who, who, who saw me? No, it was just one man. What am I doing on the ground? Jesus says, whom do you seek? And they answered, Jesus of Nazarene. And Jesus answered, I told you, I am. So if you seek me, let these go their way to fulfill the word which he spoke of those whom you've given me. I lost not one. Jesus says, I'm the one you're looking for. I'm him. I'm he. Let my disciples go. Let them go. You have no business with them. They've done nothing. I'm the one you want. He's protecting his men. And then Simon, quote, impetuous, end quote, Peter, then having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. And the slave's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put the sword into the sheath cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? All right, we, you know, I love to pick on Peter. Peter's always sticking his foot in his mouth. He's always just, you know, speak first and think later. That, that's how he is. But you got to give him this much credit. Remember, this is Peter who just recently said, I will die for you, Jesus. And Jesus looks at him and says, no, you won't. Before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. But we've got to give him this much. He's a fisherman. And it, and it says that he drew his, uh, his sword. That's not really a great translation. It's more like a dagger. You know, this big. 600 trained soldiers. And Peter whips out his knife <laughs> and starts slinging it around. How do you cut off somebody's ear with a knife? <laughs> not a very good aim. This is not a trained soldier. I'm sure he wasn't swinging for his ear. <laughs> but that's what he got was his ear. You've got to give him this much credit. He, at least at this point, said, I told you I'm going to die for you. I'm going to die for you. And if Jesus hadn't stopped everything, <laughs> you can be sure he would have died for Jesus. Because there's no way Peter, with a little knife, is going to do anything. And he whacks off this guy's ear. What John doesn't tell us that other gospel writers do is Jesus picks up the ear and puts it right back on and heals him on the spot. That's pretty cool. You can imagine the stories that were told, the conversations that were had after that whole event. Jesus turns and rebukes Peter and says, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup my father has given to me. Think about this. Jesus was a smart man. He knew the Jews were after him. He knew that Judas was going to get them, right? We, we, we saw that conversation in the upper room. He looks at him and says, what you're going to do? Go do it quickly. You're the one who's going to betray me. Go get after it. He knew that Judas is going to go get the officials and bring them. So if you don't want to get caught and you know that your enemies know where you like to hang out, 
What place do you avoid? The place that you know they're going to go look first. No, Jesus went straight there because it was time. It was time to get caught. But notice he doesn't say, shall I not do what I came to do in the minds of these folks? I've come to drink the cup my Father has given to me. The Jews are the ones that that clamored for the crucifixion of Jesus. The Romans are the ones who nailed the spikes through his hands and feet. But it was the Father, our God, who put Jesus on the cross. That's what Peter will go on to say in Acts chapter 2. We don't get the story here in John. In the other Gospels, we know that Jesus, before this event, in this same garden of Gethsemane, he went and bowed down and he said, Father, if possible, let this cup pass from me. He knows what's coming. He knows the wrath that he's going to endure on our behalf. He says, if possible, let this cup pass. But it wasn't possible. Because the only way he could atone for our sins was to drink the cup. And now that he has prayed to his father and his father has said, no, we're going through with the plan. Now Jesus has resolved to do it. And he turns to Peter and says, this cup the father has given to me, shall I not drink it? It's the reason I came. And what Peter didn't understand then, but what he understood shortly thereafter is, Peter, this is your only hope. Your only hope for all eternity is that I drink the cup of God's wrath. Because, Peter, if I don't drink this cup, you will drink it. Every sin that you and I have ever committed will be punished. Every one, every sin that any human being ever commits will be punished. Either Jesus took it for you or you will take it. Those are the only options. And Jesus says, I've come to do this. Put your sword away. It's time. So the Roman cohort and the commander and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him and led him to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was expedient for one man to die on behalf of the people. Simon Peter was following Jesus and so was another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest, but Peter was standing at the door outside. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. Then the slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, you're not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I'm not. There's one. Now the slaves and the officers were standing there having made a charcoal fire for it was cold and they were warming themselves and Peter also was with them standing and warming himself. So the soldiers bind Jesus, take him to Annas. Now you see some interesting language here. A little bit later, Annas is called the high priest, but in the section I read, Caiaphas is the high priest. Well, what's going on here? Well, Annas was the high priest, and according to Jewish law, you were a high priest for life. But then the Romans came along and said, we no longer want Annas to be the high priest, so we're going to give the priesthood to his sons. And they went through several of his sons, and finally they decided, well, we don't like any of them either. We're going to take his son-in-law, Caiaphas, and make him high priest. Well, for all the Jews, they understood that before God, Annas is the high priest, but before the Romans, the one who had the authority was Caiaphas. So the first place they bring Jesus is to the real high priest in the minds of the Jews, and that is Annas, Caiaphas' father. 
Now they, they, they bring him there and then we get this, uh, this dialogue, this, this, uh, this story of, of Peter there and this other disciple, this other disciple who is known to the high priest. He, he's allowed into the, uh, the priest's courtyard uh, and, and Peter is, is shut outside. We don't know who this other disciple is. I have my money on John. That's what makes most sense to me. Now elsewhere in John's gospel, he calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. Here he just has another disciple, and we can't be sure, but it seems more, more likely to me that it was John, and, and he goes and talks to the, the, the slave girl who's kind of the doorkeeper, and they allow Peter in, and Peter is asked, are you one of Jesus' disciples? You, are you with that guy? And here, Peter, who's just a few minutes ago ready to give his life, it seems, says, no, I don't know him. Don't associate me with him. And then we're told that they made a fire to warm their hands. That's not just John giving us the setting like a good storyteller. It's important to know that this whole thing was taking place at night. If you recall way back at the beginning of our study of John, I told you that John has a particular audience in mind when he writes this. Remember, he says it in, in, in later chapters. He says, I'm writing these things, and I've chosen the signs that I'm writing so that you may know and believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that in believing him, you will have eternal life. Remember that? That's his purpose in writing. I, he, he's writing for Jews primarily, and he wants them to be persuaded that Jesus is the Messiah so they can have eternal life. And I told you then, in order, to, in order to convince the Jews of this, that John has to do two things. First of all, he's got, got to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. He has to describe all these signs that show that he's the Messiah. But he's got to do something else as well. He has to discredit the Pharisees and the high priests or the, the priests uh, of the Jews. In the mind of the average Jew, God's truth is spoken through the Pharisees and the scribes and the priests. Those are the leaders of God's people. And they all have rejected Jesus as Messiah. So if John's readers are going to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, John has to show you can't trust the Pharisees and the scribes and the priests. If you were a Jew reading this account and you heard that Jesus had been arrested and questioned at night, you would have known something foul is happening. It was against Jewish law to have a secret and private trial. Can you imagine a government Initiating a secret, private examination of someone for, with a political agenda to lie and destroy their character before the people. Can you imagine some kind of a sham, like an impeachment or something that is all done behind closed doors? Yeah, you can. Some things never change. <laughs> so that's why we see they're around warming themselves at night. And it continues, verse 19. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Again, this is against Jewish law. They weren't allowed to question the defendant in a Jewish trial. You question witnesses. And the witnesses that were called first were the witnesses on behalf of the defendant. Then you called witnesses on behalf of the prosecution. So the way the law required was, this is done in daylight, during the normal business hours, and you bring in the defendant and then you start questioning his 
witnesses to see what their testimony is, and then you say, okay, prosecution, do you have witnesses that contradict their testimony? That's not what they do. They sneak him in at night, and they ask Jesus, tell us what you've been teaching, and who's following you? (laughs) And Jesus is calling them out on their deception and the illegality of what they're doing. He says in verse 20, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I spoke nothing in secret. Why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. They know what I said. Follow your laws and question those who've heard me. Jesus said, I didn't speak in secret. You could have tens of thousands of witnesses who can tell you what I've been teaching if you were gonna do this in the appropriate manner. Well, what do you do when you are a deceiver and leading a kangaroo court, and you just got exposed for your hypocrisy and illegality. You try to shut him up. Verse 22, when he had said this, one of the officials standing near struck Jesus, saying, is that the way you answer the high priest? Can you imagine? This soldier having the arrogance of slapping across the face the son of the living God? Now, of course, he didn't believe he was the son of the living God. Someday that man is going to stand before Jesus and give an account, as are all the rest of these people. Jesus answered, if I have spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong. But if rightly, why do you strike me? Annas has had enough. He sends him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Annas doesn't have any power, any authority with the Romans So he needs Caiaphas to give the okay to send Jesus to further trial. Meanwhile, back at the fire, Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. Number two. One of the slaves of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter denied it again, a third time, and immediately a rooster crowed. Again, John doesn't give us the whole account here. Luke tells us in one of the most gut-wrenching passages in all of the scripture for me. Picture it. Jesus is standing there before the inquirers, being interrogated, just been slapped across the face. Peter's right over there warming himself and saying, I don't know the man, And after the third time, the rooster crowed, and Luke tells us the Lord turned and met Peter's eyes. Can you imagine? Jesus, I will give my life for you. You're not going to go to Jerusalem and die over my dead body. Peter. Peter, Satan is asked to sift you like wheat. No, Lord, no, I will die for you, Peter. 
for the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Absolutely not. Who do you think I am? What kind of man do you take me for, Jesus? And then the rooster crows, and Jesus turns and looks at you. After for the third time you said, I don't know that man. Luke tells us Jesus, or Peter ran out from the courtyard and wept bitterly. You better believe he wept bitterly. He was exposed. Liar, hypocrite, weak. Betrayer. We know how this story ends. We know the fate of these Jewish leaders. The vast majority of them reject Jesus until the day of their own death. We know the story of Judas. Judas has some kind of remorse for his actions, but not true repentance. And he goes out and takes his own life. But Peter, impetuous Pete, he comes to his senses. He repents. He comes back to Jesus knowing that Jesus is a forgiving, gracious God. And Jesus is that. And Jesus says, Peter, if you love me, show it. Take care of my sheep. And it's beautiful. And Peter goes on and becomes one of the great leaders of the early church. I mean, he's still Peter. You know, there's a whole business on the rooftop thing with God and the vision of the animals and Cornelius. Yeah, okay. And then there's, there's the time that, that Paul has to rebuke him because he gets a little sheepish and doesn't want to sit with the Gentiles anymore and Paul has to call him out. But there is a tremendous transformation that takes place in Peter's life. This is the guy who gets arrested for the gospel and he's just taking a nap. He's good. all right, cool. This will be, got to work this out somehow. And again, if we can trust church history, he eventually is crucified upside down for the gospel. He does give his life for Jesus. That's good news. One thing we must learn from this passage the worst betrayer there is if he or she will repent and call out to Jesus for forgiveness, Jesus will forgive. And there's no one in this room who has done something so awful, so offensive to God, that he says, I refuse to forgive you. This room is made up of people who have betrayed Jesus at one time or another. And if you have called upon his name for forgiveness, he does not look at you with eyes of anger and wrath and how could you. He says, yes, that's what I want. Bow your knee before me. Confess your sin to me, whatever it is. And I will forgive you. Not only will I forgive you, I will send my spirit to transform you, and I will put you to work for my kingdom. Peter was not ruined for service because of his sin. Paul did even worse than Peter. Paul killed Christians. And when he repented, Jesus didn't say, oh, I can't believe I have to forgive you, but you went through the right motions and so I must. No, no, he said, yeah, I've got work for you to do. Leave the past in the past and get after it 
and take my gospel to the ends of the earth. This room is full of people who are forgiven. Whatever you've done, he forgives you. And now he says, get to work. I've got a job for you. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the cup and the bread. He said, this is the new covenant in my blood. My blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Next week, we will partake of the Lord's Supper and remember that and rejoice in his grace. I forgot to remind you that we have been taking questions. Do we have any? We have one? All right, let's see it. Verse 9 states, Of those whom you have given me, I have lost not one. John 17, 12 seems to be concerned with spiritual matters. This verse with their physical well-being. Can you elaborate and explain? Yes, I can. I'm glad you asked. Yeah, they're tied together. They're tied together. Certainly in this passage, Jesus, uh, John tells us he didn't lose any physically, but there is a connection there. He also didn't lose any of these 11 spiritually. Right then, now everyone dies, and all of these 11 eventually died, and most of them did die for the cause of Christ. But the emphasis John is bringing is first and foremost, in the context, he protected them at his own personal expense. I'm the one you came after, let these men go. He's, he's standing up for his men, he's doing what any good captain, any good general, any good leader would do. Come after me, let them go. Which is, think about it, it is the perfect illustration of what he did on the cross. He also stood before God himself and said, I'm the one you want, let them go. See that? Father, pour out your wrath on me, let them go. So that's the connection I believe that Paul, is, or that Jesus is making. All right, music team, come on up and prepare to lead us. We're going to sing as our closing song a declaration to the Lord as we say to him, we want you to build our lives on the foundation of who you are. You have a job to do, brothers and sisters. And I know the enemy at times, wants to say to you, you're not worthy. You're not worthy to call yourself a Christian. I mean, probably there's some people in this room right now that have done some things in the past week that the enemy has some ammunition there, right? Look at what you've done. Yeah, you're not worthy to be called a Christian, much less to do anything good for him. Well, maybe you need to repent of that sin. Maybe you need to work with God here a little bit and get right with God. But let me tell you, if you are in Christ, God is not the one telling you you're not worthy. That's not what he does. You know the difference between conviction of the spirit and guilt from the, from the, from the evil one, right? Satan wants to crush you. He wants to make you incapable of doing anything effective for the kingdom. And he does that so often by bringing us to such guilt and shame that we are paralyzed. The Spirit wants to bring conviction in order to bring repentance and righteousness so we'll get to work for Jesus. So whatever business you need to do with the Lord, do it. But do it as people who, because of Christ, you are worthy to build his kingdom. So let's get after it and expand our Lord's reign. Let's pray. Father, fill us with your spirit. Communicate to our souls what we need to hear. Father, for anyone in this room who's not a believer, bring them to their knees today that they would be forgiven for their sin. And for believers, would you cleanse us and purify us afresh 
set us to work. We've betrayed you, but you've forgiven us. May we be faithful to walk in the light of that truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.